Well, I, I normally, like I say, preach in a church setting, and and I'm one of those guys. I preach from from and to two. And I mean, it's like I'm starting. We talked about this last week. We moving forward, and we're gonna keep moving forward and keep moving forward, trying to get somewhere. Kind of like Moses running around out in the wilderness. We're trying to get to the promised land, and I'm trying to get you there. And so this morning makes it a little awkward for me because we're gonna just we're gonna drop down right in the middle of the spiritual jungle and start right there, and hopefully we can figure out where we're headed. You know, that's kind of where I'm at. So I just pray that Lord would fill me with what I need to do. Let's have a quick prayer and we'll get started. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. Without it, we would have no way, place to stand, no, nothing we could even understand about who you are in your nature and the nature of your Son. Lord, bless this message this morning that it would reach people. Bless it that it would fill them with whatever they need, Lord. And, and more than anything, help us to grow us because I feel like most of the folks I'm talking to here this morning know who Jesus Christ is. So what do we do with that? We learn to walk in His ways. And Lord, I just ask you to fill me with the spirit this morning and let it be in such a way that we all get filled with your spirit and guide us as we go through this day and also through our lives in jesus name i do pray amen, amen. so the i've been doing the whole book of ephesians and that's how i preach i go through the whole book we go verse by verse it's called a spot expository preaching basically expounding on what god's word says and i uh when i was i'm i'm formerly part of another of a denomination and i'm kind of separated from them because they got away from what the bible said and one of the things they told me when I was going to preaching school was, you can't go verse by verse through the Bible and preach. And I'm sitting there going, okie dokie, I don't miss it. I should have known something. I should have just turned and walked out the door at that moment because there, there's this thing that preachers like to do, and that's to grab those bumper sticker Bible verses, yeah. the ones that you see on, you know, on the back of a car or in a little thing in your Bible. And those are great. If you take them out of context, you can mislead people and lead them right to hell. I mean, they're, 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 I mean that's just the that's the thing. And yesterday I was blessed to be at Forgiven Through Christ in their chapel service, and that preacher there was named Todd, and Todd was going over uh, 20, uh, Jeremiah 29:11, which we most of y'all know what that is. The plans I have made for you, you know that verse. But he did a really good job. He actually he re he took it, he explained it, he put it in context, and he didn't. He didn't lead anybody astray, and that's why I'm afraid when I go somewhere and somebody grabs one of them little verses and they run with it, and you're like, I don't see the rest of that stuff in my Bible, you know? And I, and I get afraid of somebody getting misled, and, and right now, old Satan has got this world in total turmoil. Got everybody barking at each other, everybody angry, and so he's using every opportunity to divide us. You know, I used to say, well, there's two sides to every issue. If you watch TV right now, there's 12 sides to every issue. Yeah. Nobody can agree on anything. Yeah. They're all angry with each other. I mean, the way we get looked at when we don't walk in a place wearing a mask, it's like, you know, I've been judged and I've been tried and executed all at the same moment. I mean, and, 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 I, and I understand the fear. I don't want to make anybody sick. I'm the last person in the world, but I, I don't like that judgment feeling. I mean, because I'm just a child of God and I make mistakes every day. I mean, I, you know, I put my clothes on like everybody else. But anyway, I'm going to start with this verse, and this comes out of me being in Ephesians. Unfortunately, you guys are going to get on the you're going to get the, the long ride. We're going to Sturgis today in our, in our ride because it's going to be long. How are we going to get there? Now, I think David lied to me. He said he normally preaches about two hours, and I think he probably lied a little bit. Preachers do that, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just I thought that was hilarious. He's trying to get me in trouble with his people right now. But anyway, Ephesians 5 verse 18 says, "And do not get drunk with wine." For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm starting to, I'm starting with that verse because that's the last place I left off, but where we're going is all over the place. And I want you to, to just that verse, I want to start right there. It says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to talk to you about that word debauchery. debauchery. Most of these people in here are old enough to remember a guy named Freddie Fender. And he sang a song called Wasted Days and yes. Wasted Nights. Yes. And that's what debauchery is. It's living a wasted life. And, and you can be actually wasted, by the way. That's another way to waste your life. But I mean, it's a wasted life situation. It's where you're not doing what God called you to do. And it doesn't have to be alcohol. It's just wasting time doing stuff that is not for the kingdom. It's wasting your days. It's wasting everything you're doing instead of doing what He's called you to do. And so... That is everybody, but there's, there's, God put this on me when I walked in this building this morning. He said, there is beauty 
in your purpose. There's great beauty in your purpose. Whatever God has called you to do, He designed you for a reason. He made you for a purpose. He's got something planned for you. I, I, I told somebody the other day in church, I said, we have men's breakfast every so often. And I told that guy, I said, your spiritual gift is frying bacon. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not picking on him, but that's his calling. And in this room are several people I know quite well. I'm not going to, I hate calling them out. They're going to be mad at me. Patricia has a heart to serve. David and Dennis both have a, a heart for unity, bringing all these ministries together. That is their purpose. Now, what's so crazy about that, now they physically try, David and Dennis try to have unity, try to create unity, so do I, same thing. But our unity comes from the Holy Spirit because we are the body of Christ. How we get there, and it does require our input. In other words, we, it, it's not something we just gifted. You've got to work at it. But when God gets in it, and he helps you to do it, you can do things that nobody can do by themselves. And that explains a lot of what Christie's House has and how and it's amazing ministry and how many people come and how many people are blessed. And same thing with what Dennis has done. By the way, this is doggone David Pruitt and that's hot dog Dennis Martin back there in the back. Anyway, those two, uh, that's their nicknames. I, I, can, I can nickname them. They got names for me too, I'm sure. He calls me the director. We won't get into that either. But um, anyway, there's a, there's a famous preacher from the past, and really, there's two famous expressions that he always had. And, and I think about him, his number one one, and you guys will get this when he says, character is what you are in the dark. What your character really is, is what you are when you're alone in the dark. Now, God can see everything. There's nothing to skip. But the one, that, one of his famous quotes that I really love and it kind of got me, and that's where this message came from. They, the, guy's, the guy's name is Nathan Hunter. His name is D.L. Moody, one of the most famous preachers ever. And they asked him, why do you always talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit? And he said, because I leak. Now think about that. Because he what? He leaks. Because I leak. That's why I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I got to think about me. You know, there are times in your life when you've driven an old junk car, a hoopty, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what y'all call it. I call it all kinds of names, but... If you got a, a leaking tire, you can go a while, but you gotta go put some more air in it, don't you? You got a leaking radiator, you can go a little while, but you gotta put some more fluid in it, you're gonna overheat. And both of those things will keep you from moving forward. And in this walk on this planet, on this earth, unless you are filled with the Spirit, you can't move forward. And you gotta be refilled. There's a, there's a verse in 2 Corinthians. I love what it says. It says, 2 Corinthians verse 4, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Every day we need a fresh, fresh cup of the Holy Spirit. We need to be refilled. We need to have that in us so that we can move forward. That's where our strength comes from. That's where our hope comes from. That's, where, that's how we live and how we move and breathe and walk and, in a world where everybody's wearing masks and acting stupid and all this is going on. That's how you... That's how you don't get discouraged. That's how you get depressed. That's how you live and show people who Jesus is in spite of what the world's doing. So I, I think about that, but I'm going to take you over to John 14, 15. Then we're going to go to Genesis. We're going to go back to the beginning of this spirit thing. But today's message is really about the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit and its refilling and infilling and how it makes us where we can get God's work done. So let me get over to John chapter 14, 15. John 14, 15. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot see, because neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Jesus is telling us, these are, these are those red letter words, that I'm going to be inside of you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to carry you through what's going on, kind of like the Psalm 23, my cup runneth over, and I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's, that's the same message that Jesus is giving them here now. now I'm going to take you back now, way back, to Genesis 1. Y'all going to be jumping around. I bet y'all can find Genesis 1. That's pretty close to the front. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. The very first verse of the Bible. I want you to listen to this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. 
and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit is the power of God, and it is sitting there waiting. It is waiting to do something. God is about to give purpose to all the things that we understand creation is. He's about to speak all those things into existence, but waiting to give the power to get it done is the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and then God says, I'm going to create this, I'm going to make that, I'm going to create the animals, and so forth. But it's really important that we understand the difference in humans as we look through it, because God spoke all of those other things into existence. He immediately said, He spoke it and it happened. But He did something different when He got to you and me. It says that He formed us. He made us. He put His hands on us. He touched us. He gave us His power. He gave us His Spirit. And He made us a little lower than the angels. And He said, look, you are my creation. I created you for a purpose. And, and you need to understand that Spirit is, is our purpose to get things done. But we, He created this vessel. And if you don't understand the idea of the vessel, we are the body of Christ. And every one of us has a different spiritual gift. Every one of us has a different job to do. And like I said, I wasn't kidding about frying the bacon. That's a real job that you would do in, in, in serving people. I imagine that Patricia's probably cooked a little bit of food for Christy's house and done a little bit of serving. And that's how you help people. Yeah, you're available to them. And you read them across the table and you love on them. Love's real important in this Christian walk. Because you can't hate them or have any kind of thing like that toward them and, and still be a Christian in my mind. So that, that's where we are. Um, but on the on the second, let me get the I'm gonna go back to, I'm gonna go to Genesis 2 real quick. Verse 7. And Lord God formed man out of dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a, a, be, a, a living being. You realize God did not breathe life into all those animals, he just said speak, because he had to put the spirit in us, he had to breathe it into us. Now you say, Well, how do you say that? Well, guess what? Jesus Christ did the exact same thing many years later in the New Testament. Let me find it right. There we go. John 20, 21 and 22. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So you see, Jesus Christ himself, many years later, did exactly what God did at the beginning of time. He breathed the Holy Spirit into people. He, he made, you know, that's what makes us different. You know, people ask me sometimes, are dogs going to be in heaven? Well, I don't know. But they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. They're not, they're not, you know what I mean? It's not important. Now, I mean, it's just, my understanding of what heaven is, is it's based on what New Jerusalem is. And that is, it will be a world some like what we understand a world to be. In other words, people will be living and praising and serving God, but there'll be some of the normal things that we're used to seeing, you know? And, and I think that's, uh, you know, I, I think maybe if you had a garden on earth and you was a good gardener, you probably got a really awesome garden in heaven. You know, I think I think it just continues. I think it's just something, it's a better life than we ever can imagine. No, no pain, no suffering, no nothing. It's just all perfect. And so we think about that. But anyway, moving on to, uh, I'm going to go to Jeremiah 18 because there's this idea that God formed us and He filled us. We are a vessel. He formed us out of clay. He made us. And in Jeremiah 18, Y'all know the story of the potter, and I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to talk about it. The part that's amazing in the story that people probably miss of the potter, they went down, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and God spoke to him, and he said, Look, he said, I'm taking this pot, and this pot is marred. This pot is messed up. This pot is beyond recognition. But I'm going to take this clay and I'm going to reshape it. I'm going to make it something really good. I'm going to make it into something that, that I can use in my kingdom. I'm going to reform it. You think maybe he was talking about you? You messed up. You made some mistakes. You, you, you're living outside of what God has called you to live. And he takes you this messed up. And in that story, he was talking to Israel. They're always being disobedient. He was always bringing them back. And they finally, he remade that pot and then he filled it. That's us. You know, when, when you think about the fact that God chose us before the beginning of time, I'll go there real quick. Y'all know Psalm 139, 13 through 16? 
For you formed my inward parts. You covered my, me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and my, my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when I was yet there was none of them. Before you were ever born, God made you. And He formed you. He spent the time. He knows every hair on your head, even us that got less than a little bit of hair. He knows everything about us. He knows He created us for a purpose. That our beauty is found in our purpose. And if we don't live into that, and, and, and one of the things I would tell you is the gifts that we get spiritually, the gifts that we need, are what allow us to do what God calls us to do in spite of whatever it is. If 10 years ago when I became a pastor, I could not get up in front of anybody and speak. I was terrified. So I would say that my gift from God was that He turned me from a person who was terrified and timid to be able to stand in front of a whole group of strangers now and tell you about Jesus. That is what our power of the Holy Spirit is all about, is to give us the power to talk about Jesus in boldness, no matter where you are. That is what Jesus' power is all about. Now, does that look different in different places with different people? Yes. You feed somebody, you buy them a meal, you love on them, you do something for them, that's Jesus talking. It's not necessarily that you know the Word. You're not a Bible scholar. You don't have to do all that. I'm not a Bible scholar. I laughed this morning when I read the post that Dennis said they were having this great preacher coming to, to the Baptist church. He said, man, I want to go. I'm going to see who that is. I know he's talking about me. Anyway, but uh, it's one of those, we are called and we have a purpose. And, and we, we cannot forget that. So I'm going to continue on my little journey here. In uh, Acts, 1.8, it talks about, and I'm going to stop for a minute. I, I shared this with my church the other morning because we got off for just a second talking about sharing the gospel. The simplest gospel message I can tell you is comes out of Romans 8. I'm sorry, Romans 5.8. And it is the last half of the verse, and I don't like breaking verses, but it's so it's easy to remember. It's eight words. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you can remember those eight words, you can share the gospel. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still messing up, while we were still falling down, while we were doing all those wrong things, Christ knew it. He knew you needed a Savior. He knew what to do. And, I, and, and then when they want to ask questions, then I, then I would go to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They say, well, I don't need that. I ain't sinned. Well, guess what? 100% of all people have ever sinned except Jesus Christ. He's the only blameless, sinless person to ever walk this planet. So everybody needs what Jesus has got. And it's hard sometimes to tell them that. And I love watching people, I even say this, God will make them struggle. He'll show them the light eventually. I, one of the great things about these ministries is they fire me up because I see people that God will not let go of. They want to run, they want to hide, they want to get away from me, and God just slaps them around like a dog and says, come on, y'all need to get your eyes together because I'm not going to turn loose of you. I love you too much. And that's Jesus Christ. That's how He works. He turns people around. I, I know plenty of examples, and I'm going to name names. I mean, these people over in this row over here that I know, they can name hundreds of names of people that Jesus never turned His back on. And He never will. Amen. You can turn your back on God, but He ain't going to turn His back on you. So you just remember that. So when you think about the Holy Spirit and its purpose for you, and think about the body of Christ. Okay, so I don't know how to... I, I'm, a, I'm an analogy guy. That's what I do. I try to teach people the simplest way to look at something. So God has a purpose. A collective purpose for all of us. Everybody in this room, he has a collective purpose. And everybody has some little job that they're supposed to do. And no, not everybody's going to be a mouse. Somebody might be a pinky toe, all right? Anybody ever hang your pinky toe on the corner of the couch? You might be that pinky toe. But he can use you. He can use you as a purpose for you. He gives you the gifts to do. He doesn't call the qualified, right? He qualifies the call. So whatever your job is, he will give it to you. And it's amazing to me that people cannot see their spiritual gift. Because sometimes it's so simple. It's staring right in the face. God's wanting to use them to do something. He's wearing them out in their brain. Saying, hey, you need to go help out there and do that over there. And you're like, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. He ain't going to let up. And I, and I tell you, when you start walking in His ways and moving forward, man, He will bless you. I mean, in ways you cannot even imagine. You can't outgive God and you can't outrun God. So just might as well give up and let Him have you for, and be done with it. So I think, I think about that and the idea of the spiritual 
realm, God gives us these gifts and every person in the body of Christ has a job and you have a purpose. And I've worked my whole life since I was about 13 years old, just like most people. And I understand that God gave me all those opportunities. And it wasn't until I was an old man that I figured out I need to be doing what I'm doing right now. I ran from it. From the time I was about 20, he wanted me to be a preacher. I'm 57 years old. It took me until I was 47 to figure out I need to be a preacher. He had to knock me down a few times. He may be doing that to you today. There's no time that's too late. If you're still here and breathing, God's got a job for you. You know, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the end of this. I'm not a long-winded preacher. Um, when you talk about the power of the Holy Spirit and what it can do in people, in Acts 1.8, it says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So the absolute main purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit is to be a witness. Now that looks different for everybody. I'm serious. It might just be eating dinner with your mama. I mean, it can be that simple that you could be a witness for your mom or whoever it might be. I, I, uh, Dennis hooked me up with somebody to help here recently and I, and, I, and, and I get angry pretty easy when people mislead people. And uh, I'm not going to name names or anything. But this young lady was terrified because the church that she was attending told her that if she could not speak in tongues, she was not saved. Okay? I'm just, I'm just laying it out there. And it's not my job to get another pastor's business. I, I, you know, I get that. That's why I say that we all have different spiritual gifts because... Us all speaking in tongues will not feed somebody. God gives everybody a purpose. And God is not some, I know this is going to sound rough, God is some not some intergalactic Elvis who's wearing a bright orange jumpsuit and he does stuff for flash. He does stuff for a purpose. When he gives you a spiritual gift, it is for a reason so he can get something done in the kingdom. It is not just to show out and, and, and to, to, to let everybody look at me, hey, look at what I got. I, got, I get really angry when people try to limit those who can be in the kingdom. In the early, early church, there was this group called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics had this habit of telling people that if you didn't have their special knowledge of the Bible, if you didn't have their special knowledge of what they knew and how they understood things, you couldn't, be, you couldn't go to heaven and you couldn't be a part of their church. That thief on the cross, he never spoke a tongue. He never got baptized. He never did anything but say, I believe you're Jesus Christ. I believe you're the King. I believe you're the Son of God. It only takes faith to be saved. Yes, you should be baptized and get a, a profession of faith. And yes, you do get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But there are at least nine spiritual gifts listed in the Bible that you can get that have nothing to do with speaking in tongues. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not against people speaking in tongues. I hang out with some wonderful people that speak in tongues. But I just don't think you should limit what God can do ever with people. God came that all might be saved not just the ones who speak in tongues, okay? I mean, I just, I mean, I just, that was, I kind of got angry about that, but not my place. I'm not gonna argue doctrine with people. That's not why I'm here. My, my purpose is to bring as many as I can to the, to the kingdom, not scare some off. That's not the point. It's easy to scare people. People are, are, are uh, what's the word? Self-conscious enough about that they're a sinner and they're not good enough to go to heaven. We ain't ever gonna be good enough to go to heaven. I talked to a guy at work one time, and I mean, and boy, he went down a, long, a wrong, horrible trail after that, but he kept telling me, well, I think I'm good enough to go to heaven. There's no such thing. There is nothing in you that makes you worthy of going to heaven. Not a single thing. Zero. The only value a human being has on planet Earth, Jesus Christ put there. You are counted as righteous. You are not righteous. One, one of the things that that God did when He formed you. And, and, and people don't know how to use this word sometimes. He, he, he made us, here we go. Those who He called, He made holy. And you're like, whoa, 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 holy, that's somebody who's, you know, who's perfect and doesn't sin. No, no, no. Holy means set apart. Holy means He chose you for a purpose. Holy means you're somebody He can use. You see how messed up them people were in the Old Testament? I mean, some messed up folks and did all kind of crazy stuff. But God set you apart for a purpose. And He knows you fail. He knows you fall down, but He's going to use you anyway. And, his, and that holy thing, when I think about the temple and the, and the stuff that, and the cups and the thing that they had inside the temple for all the services, 
and, and God used those things. And it's easy for me to make that parallel because all this stuff was set aside to use to worship God. All these things that they had, the showbread, and all these different things that they used in the temple were because they were set aside. Well, God set you aside for a purpose. He chose you so that He could use you to get something done. I'm not trying to be, I'm a very much a get it done kind of guy. And so I want to share one real quick thing you talk about. Well, why are you talking about the Old Testament and the priests and all that? In 1 Peter 1, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation. Got that? You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Everybody in here, you're a royal priesthood. Think about that for a minute. So you've been you've been assigned this holy other task. You are you are a person of God. You're a child of God. You're a holy nation. You're His own special people. You hear that? You're His own special people. I like being called special by God because I'm pretty special anyway, but it's a different kind of special. But you understand God loves you. You're special to Him. He created you. I don't want you to understand that. If I can get that across that you're special and you have a purpose and your beauty is in your purpose and if you serve your purpose, He'll bless you. If you live for Him, it, it is amazing what He can do through you. And it says that you... Mo and here's the deal. Every time you keep coming back to this, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. He did that to, so that you could proclaim the light that is Jesus Christ. There is no other reason. There's nothing that matters more than that you walk in the light of Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can do in your life. And, and you can do it in a million ways and, because God uses every one of us. It doesn't matter what brand of church we go to. It doesn't matter how we, you know, what how we dress or what our color of our skin is or any of that stuff. What matters is who we live for and how we live, and we allow Him to bless us. Now, I'm going to close this thing up now because y'all don't want to spend the rest of the day listening to me rant. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13. First. First, First Corinthians, sorry, 12 and 13, chapter 12, chapter 13. It talks about the diversity of the gifts, how all of us are on Team Jesus. And if we're on Team Jesus, we're going to have what we need to do what we need to do. I, I may, actually, I made this comparison the other day in church. I said, who's the greatest quarterback of all time? I got 17 different answers, but John Elway was the one that most people said. If I took a whole football team full of John Elways, and put them up against the best football team playing today. We don't know who that is now with COVID. But anyway, put them up against that team. The John Elway team would get slaughtered because all they can do is throw a ball. You need everybody else. They're going to run over him. They're going to kill him because he's this little guy. Imagine what that would look like. That's what trying to make the church of Jesus Christ look like one person in one way looks like. Is You'd have a whole bunch of people who want to be the star, and that's not what church is. Church is the body of Christ getting it done as a complete team. We all got a place. We all got a chance to serve. We can do some amazing things together. And it only takes a little bit. A little bit. I'm the cameraman. That's my normal job. I'm on the other side. I share these ministries because I think people need to hear what Jesus has to say through the lives of people giving testimonies and living. That's why I do what I do. I don't care to be out in front. Dennis Markham was the worst person getting out in front because he, he had to like tie him up and drag him in front of people. You know? But when we finally get him up there, he got something important to say, and I'm, I'm yeah. blessed to know him, you know. Amen. But but the diversity of gifts in one body is what this is all about. And it talks about in 12.12, um, it says, For as in the body is one, has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, see also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and we all made the drink into one Spirit. That unity that my two brothers have been preaching on lately, that unity is created by the Holy Spirit. That's what ties us together. That's why if I get on a plane, and I'm going to say this, I hate to do it out loud, but I'm, I do this, I don't care, I offend everybody. I get on a plane and sit next to somebody, and they're a churchgoer, churchgoer, I have a hard time having a connection with them. But if they're a born-again child of Christ, we're brothers. 
I can feel it. We can talk, and there's there's a connection between us that you can't separate. That goes for everybody in here. When you get beside a born again child of God and you share your testimony or whatever, you just talk about stuff. You know, you can see it, you can feel it. It's not somebody who's faking. Well, God gave me a very good discerning spirit about that, and I'm like, okay, that's great. Now, when are you gonna get saved? Yeah. You know, I'm just being honest. We all have the opportunity to, to know Jesus Christ, and it's the simplest thing ever. So I'm going to jump over real quick, and this kind of speaks to what I was angry about earlier. In verse 13, I mean, sorry, chapter 13, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And it goes on to talk about all these gifts of the Spirit, but the most important thing is love. I'm not going to go into all of them today, and that's fine. I'm going to close this thing up right now because i got... One final thought. In the beginning, I took you to Genesis, right? Yes. Very first verse of the Bible. I'm going to take you to the very last chapter of the Bible. And I want you to hear the very last time the Spirit's mentioned. So this Spirit thing, it started with us. It was formed in us. It was given to us. It refills us when we fall down. It's something we need to work on every day so that we have that power. We don't get disgusted discouraged, we don't get disgusted, we don't get upset, we don't get angry, we fill ourselves with the Spirit, we can do some things, and we can overcome some craziness in this world and show people Jesus by living and walking in ways that, he, that people can't even understand. Well, how can that guy not be mad? I just chewed him out. He just, he just kept on going. Because the power can do that. But if you go to Revelation 22, 17, it's the end of days. Everything's over. And the Spirit's still speaking. And the Spirit said, and the bride says... Who is the bride of Christ? We are. Everybody. The Spirit and the bride says, Come, and let him who hears come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. The message of the Spirit is boldness to be able to preach the gospel to people like we're doing right now this morning. The Spirit of God is what allows us to be well, you want to know? I, for me, it makes me an extrovert. I am not. I'm an introvert. I'm one of those people who likes to sit and whatever. That's just me. I'm a nerd more than anything else. My wife likes nerd. Thank God. Anyway. But I appreciate y'all this morning listening to me. And I, and I just want you to understand, you are a forgiven child of God. I mean, if you're not, see, that's the thing. You preach all this and you tell all these people in this room that they're a forgiven child of God and you show it and you live it, if there's somebody in here today that is not, they start going, hmm, I think I want some of that. I need some of that. I need to be able to not get angry at everybody else. I need to be able to live like that. I need to have, have hope and a future like it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. And all it takes is a walk and an answer and a prayer and some and some and just some focus on who God is. I, I mean, a lot of people I deal with, you know, that have that, fallen off the tracks a couple times. I've fallen off tracks a bunch of times. But there is a chance every day when you wake up before your feet ever hit the ground, you need to praise God and thank Him for another day. And understand that He wants to use you today. And everybody says, well, I don't know what the will of God is. Very simple. Very simple. It's not rocket science. You read this book. You pray. And if you like to fast, that's probably not good for fat people. But if you like to fast, God can reach you. And He can guide you. And that Holy Spirit was sent for one specific purpose. Jesus called it a helper. Everybody needs a helper. Adam got Eve. That didn't go so well. That was his first helper. But God fixed that. I have a helper that blesses me. He has a helper that blesses him. He has a helper that blesses him. We all have a helper in our household. But the most important helper we have is the Holy Spirit because it allows us to do things that we cannot even think about. We. The, I'm always amazed because I'll preach something to somebody and they'll come up afterwards and they'll tell me something that they heard. I never said that. I never said that because when I preach, there's a Holy Spirit wall between me and you and what I say and what you hear, God filters into your heart based on where you're at in your walk. So I have people come tell me stuff I'm like, I said yes, thank you or whatever, but I know that I didn't say those things. But I can watch the video back. I know I didn't say those things. That was God working on you, working on your heart, working on you, telling you what you needed to hear. And I pray today that somebody got what they needed to hear. Amen? Amen. Let, let us pray.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we had this morning. God, we thank you for this opportunity to, to be together and worship as the body of Christ. We have a job. We are, we are to live and breathe and just inspire others to who Jesus is in our own lives. If we don't, the worst thing about the church is being a hypocrite. We cannot let the world see a bunch of hypocrites because they will not be interested. If we look like the world, they won't care. If we act like the world, they won't care. If we change our lives and act like we're supposed to act and live and serve and, and just reach out and love on people, they'll say, hey, you got something. And I think I want some of that. Lord, help us to be that witness as we leave here today. Help us to be that witness when we go to the bank or wherever we might go. We go into a restaurant, wherever we might go, Lord. We go into our family's home. We go around other people, Lord. Just let us be the light that you called us to be because with your spirit, we can shine so brightly and accomplish more. It's not about us, Lord. It's all about you and the power that you put in us to get your will done because there is absolutely great beauty in our purpose for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.